I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict, we have with us Dr. Seth Jones, a senior vice president at CSIS and director of our international security program. Seth, welcome to the podcast. We've got a lot to talk about. First, I want to talk about the military objectives that Israel has going on here with Hamas. Initially, the rhetoric was needed to eliminate Hamas. Some of that rhetoric has softened since those early days. What's coming next and what do you think is achievable? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. By the way, it is great to be on your podcast. It is the best podcast that is out there. So it is always a pleasure to be on. Well, thank you, Seth. You're my favorite guest, as you know. On the question of military objectives, Israeli leaders initially committed to destroying Hamas, not severely weakening or degrading Hamas. You know, when I was in the U.S. government, including in special operations, there were some statements that came out of the U.S. political leaders early on after 9-11 about eliminating al-Qaeda and even some other terrorist groups. Al-Qaeda obviously still exists. ISIS still exists. So I do think the Israelis have to be a little bit careful in over-promising what they can do, especially if the fighting stays contained to Gaza, because Hamas has operatives in the West Bank. They've got them outside of the West Bank and Gaza in other countries. It's going to be hard to eliminate Hamas as an organization. I think there has been and there will be Palestinian terrorist groups that continue to operate. But I think what Israel can do and what it's preparing to do and what its rhetoric is now coming around to is severely weaken, degrading uh, Hamas as an organization, both politically and militarily. And so I think what that means is a range of efforts initially in Gaza, combined air strikes, F-15s, F-16s, drones with capabilities like Hellfire missiles, boots on the ground eventually. You do think there'll be boots on the ground? I think they have to put boots on the ground. I don't think you can severely weaken an organization like this without putting some boots on the ground. And the Israelis have done this. When you look at Operation Cast Lead, for example, or Operation Protective Edge, these were Israeli operations in Gaza that involved IDF, boots on the ground. Now, Those operations were nowhere near as large. The casualty estimates for the IDF were 14 during cast lead. During um, Protective Edge, there were 67 uh, Israeli Defense Forces killed. And those were relatively small operations that lasted a few days, really a month for cast lead to more like two months with Protective Edge. Uh, This one could take longer. This may be larger in size and scope, and this may be more difficult if they're trying to achieve a much broader objective, even if it's severely degrading Hamas. So I think they have to put some number of boots on the ground. In order to do that, you need to protect them as you're moving them in, probably armored personnel carriers, probably going to want some firepower with tanks, uh, Merkava main battle tanks. And then Israelis have often used bulldozers as they've destroyed Hamas houses to move rubble out of the way or try to clear out areas. I suspect they're going to be pretty innovative in how they do this. The IDF is one of, if not the top military in the world to conduct urban combat. They've got extensive experience. So I think I'll just leave with some questions along these lines. How large of a force do they actually put on the ground in Gaza? Is it a combination of regular and special operations units? What's that mix look like? What about the geographic location? Do they focus mostly on northern Gaza or do they have to bleed into central and southern Gaza if they have Hamas operatives uh, shifting down there, which they almost certainly will, and support network? How long do you stay and what do you do in addition to combat operations when you're there? Do you set up checkpoints to monitor population flows? There are a range of things that I think are going to be interesting. And how do they involve other Palestinian entities, if at all, like the authority, for example? So I think those are all questions that we'll have to see. But I suspect, I mean, they all are going to be part of the campaign plan. Seth, you're familiar with this kind of urban combat, having worked in special ops in the United States during Afghanistan, Iraq. What are the Israelis going to be facing in Gaza? Is it different than what we faced in those two conflicts, the United States? I mean, urban warfare is difficult for a whole range of reasons. I think the Israelis... In Gaza, what's a little bit different here are two things. One is it is a contained environment. In some ways, that's a help for the Israeli Defense Forces because there's no place for Hamas 
operatives to go. They can't leave the way we saw some ISIS or even Al-Qaeda members do after 9-11, for example, when bin Laden himself shifted across the Afghan-Pakistan border and settled in Pakistan and then survived for another decade. There's nowhere to go here. The downside of that with Gaza is because there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to go for civilians either. So it means they're operating in an environment where there are going to be significant numbers of civilians. In fact, Gaza has a population of 20,000 people per square mile, which is among the highest population densities in the world. So there are some differences, but the U.S. did have the ability to work with local forces in a couple of these fights, the Iraqis particularly in Fallujah, and it did mean that there was an ability to put local host nation partner forces in the lead in some areas. Israelis don't really have that option. It's going to be the Israeli face on this operation. But, you know, regardless, they're going to be facing snipers, improvised explosive devices, suicide bombers, anti-tank missiles, rocket-propelled grenades, drones. We've already seen some versions of that. And loitering munitions, which are essentially suicide drones. They're going to face a pretty hostile environment. Uh, they're also going to face multiple groups. People talk about Hamas, but as we've seen with the potential for this rocket attack, we've got at least Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We've got probably some number of civilians that may pick up weapons and fire at Israeli forces. And then we've got other complications, including narrow alleyways to operate in tall buildings, tunnels uh, in Gaza. So complex environment, one that the Israelis have worked in in the past, but one should not underestimate the challenges of working in Gaza. How do you fight in tunnels when the tunnels are somewhat known, largely unknown, tight spaces where, you know, a lot of times soldiers in the IDF can only go in single file? What does that look like? What kind of objective can you actually achieve in that scenario? Well, I think in many cases, what you'd ideally want to do is put a big enough bomb that destroys the tunnel and collapses it. The challenge we have here, which is an additional one from what we've talked about, is hostages. So right. uh, it is likely that some number of hostages may be in tunnels. So in that case, what's probably first and foremost important is a massive intelligence gathering collection effort from signals intelligence, from human intelligence assets that the Israelis have, and a whole range of other intelligence capabilities that the Israelis are able to do, pull them together, fuse it, and see who is in which tunnels, what are the entrance and exit ways, and if they have to put in forces into those tunnels, you're probably talking about your top types of special operations forces that are used to operating in environments like that. I mean, this is not routine fighting. You don't have people that drive tanks conduct this kind of warfare. So these are really elite soldiers but it's going to be based on Israel's intelligence picture of who's in there and whether it actually makes sense to go in. What are some of the tech advantages that Israel has in this conflict? Well, Israel has some of the best intelligence collection capabilities in the world. It signals intelligence capabilities. It has the ability through a range of its fixed-wing aircraft and drones also to use the sensor platforms on them to collect uh, information. It can see thermal imaging. Israel's also got precision strike capabilities. So when it drops bombs, whether it's paveways or joint direct attack munitions, those are kits that you can put on dumb bombs, or firing hellfires, these are precision guided weapons that if the Israelis want to put a precision missile through a window on the fourth floor of a building, I mean, and you've got the right trajectory going in, they can do that with that kind of precision. Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the other groups operating Hamas do not have generally that kind of intelligence collection capability, though it does appear that Hamas may have been helped to some degree by the Iranians on cyber defense capability and also it probably improved its operational security or OPSEC capabilities. Hamas may have been able to thwart with Iranian help Israel's collection capabilities on some systems. But I mean, Israel's going to have the huge technological advantage in this fight. Where Hamas and some of the groups will have some advantages is less on the technological side and more in understanding the terrain in neighborhoods that they live in or, you know, fight in and know better than the Israelis. So uh, some trade-offs, but on the technological side, there's no question the Israelis have a significant advantage. And as you mentioned, Hamas has a tremendous advantage in that they have either 199 hostages, 200 hostages, 250 
or up, they have a lot of Israeli, American, French hostages. There's a lot of people who've been captured. What does that do to Israel and their efforts to have to try to achieve military objectives? Well, look, in urban warfare, buildings and infrastructure is destroyed. Uh, civilians, unfortunately, are killed. There is no case of urban combat, serious urban combat that's protracted over days and weeks and months where civilians aren't killed. It's the unfortunate reality where fighting is happening and there are civilians that are still there. In addition to that, the Israelis have to deal with Hamas and other groups that have and will continue to use civilians as human shields. They have and will likely continue to smuggle weapons and fighters in ambulances, may also use parts of hospitals for weapons depots. These are all designed to try to bait the Israelis into striking civilian targets, into killing innocent civilians. So these are issues that are gonna become important as the Israelis are going through target sets and collecting intelligence. They have a pretty good process anyway. They're gonna to have to be pretty careful because as we've seen in the last couple of days, that a strike, whether it was the Israelis or not, has the potential for inflaming the street in Jordan, Iman, in Iraq, in Baghdad, in Lebanon, and Beirut, and across the Arab world. We've even seen some of that in Asia. We've seen some attacks along those lines in Europe, certainly the United States, we could see that as well. So I do think the Israelis have to be careful as much as they can. You know, no country, certainly Israel, wants to kill civilians. Right. So uh, they will do everything they can to limit that. But it is not achievable for zero casualties. And the same thing goes for Hamas and Islamic Jihad fighting. I mean, they've already killed an enormous amount of Israeli civilians, women, children that couldn't even defend themselves. Babies. Babies. Elderly. Yeah. So, but again, urban combat, this is going to happen. Yeah. And this brings me to a question that I have about, you know, the morality of war that Israel has to think about. The United States had to think about it in Iraq and Afghanistan. And decisions do need to be made. And there are civilians, as you said, being used as shields. Um, some could get caught inadvertently, whether they're being used as human shields or not, and they just can't get out of a certain area. What's the equation for the Israelis here? I mean, the hospital attack that we've been sort of skirting around, you know, already the United States has indicated that their intelligence, as well as the Israeli intelligence, say that this was a, a, a misfire by an Islamic jihad rocket. And there's lots of evidence to that extent. But that hasn't tamped down the inflammation in the region that you just described. Put on top of that, you have morality of war issues on a minute by minute basis during this. So how does Israel think about this? How does Israel learn from the United States' example? Yeah, this is a really interesting, important and difficult question. Countries like the United States, Israel, the United Kingdom, and there are many others that have fought in these types of wars, including in urban terrain, do, I think, have a responsibility to um, abide by the laws of war. And one of the important ones is not to deliberately target civilians. Countries like Russia certainly do not abide by those kinds of laws. We've seen the Russians, including Russian soldiers, conduct enormous human rights abuses in Ukraine. Um, and then we have seen mistakes made over the last several decades. The U.S. did accidentally target civilians in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, and other locations. Uh, I think there is an onus uh, when those kinds of incidents take place that countries then take responsibility for them. They pull together investigations that take a look at what happened and that they try to correct them. Uh, but ultimately, they take responsibility and they work to correct them. So that's one. Second is to put processes in place. Israelis have this anyway for targeting. Uh, so your targeting process pulls together all source intelligence. You have to think very carefully about who's in the building that you're targeting. Are there members of Hamas or Islamic Jihad? Are there civilians in and around the area? What type of bomb do you use? What's the weight of it? Uh, what's the impact likely to be? So there are all these processes that get in place, uh, get put in place for making decisions on whether to strike, uh, what weapon to use? Do you have ground forces take the action 
or do you drop bombs from an aircraft? So, so all these things become important in the targeting process. And the third thing, which we'll probably see some evolution in how the Israelis respond to, particularly after the hospital incident, is the speed with which information moves is so quick with the social media that we have here that it's going to be very important to come out quickly uh, after a rough assessment of what happened and then to declassify information about what happened. So if the Israelis have what normally would be classified information from drones or satellite imagery to declassify it quickly, the U.S., had to take some of these steps before and during the early phases of the war in Ukraine to declassify information. That was a bit of a bureaucratic fight. Uh, I think the Israelis are going to have to do that as well. They've already done it. Um, so that becomes an important part of it is getting ahead of the information campaign, because as we've seen, assuming this is an Islamic Jihad rocket that went astray, Hamas moved quickest in uh, in the response and got reactions. So I think gonna, there needs to be a speed element to this as well. Well, you know, what's so interesting about social media and media in general um, in this equation is, you know, during the Arab Spring, social media was very useful for journalists and for citizens of the world to understand what was actually going on during the Arab Spring. Here, the conflict has shifted and social media is actually mucking up and clouding the picture. So it makes it doubly hard. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I think we have some media outlets that are better or responding better. I was on CNN last night talking about a strike. They, this is Tuesday night, the night the night of the, uh, the disaster at this hospital. The Israelis had just announced uh, that they were releasing video footage of the uh, rocket that went astray and also of signals intelligence or SIGINT of members of Hamas and Islamic Jihad talking about it, that this was their rocket. We hadn't had a chance to hear it yet and, and I hadn't had a chance to take a look and assess the veracity of it. So CNN, they interviewed an IDF spokesman, but I said, look, we can't, we can't comment. We haven't had time to go through it. So they responsibly held off on doing any analysis openly, publicly on TV until they could have experts go through privately to assess. Then they went, then they started to go public. That's that's a much better way of approaching it. The problem is, as you note, um, that's not happening on social media platforms. And that's partly because either people are biased in their views, they don't care, or they're deliberately putting out mis or disinformation. And you're also having the problem of you know, say the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC all say, OK, well, the United States has assessed. Israel has assessed. There's evidence. There's there's audio evidence. There's visual evidence, and including the visual evidence where, you know, if it had been an Israeli rocket, or Israeli missile, there would have been huge craters. There weren't things like that. But it's too late in some of the places that are really inflamed, like Amman, like in the West Bank, other places that, you know, have already assumed that this was Israel that did it. Yeah, I think what this requires, honestly, is, and this is probably a good lesson for the U.S. going forward as it gets involved in in, in future wars, is to put together a task force designed specifically to move quickly and to declassify information that when things like this come out, they are able to move rapidly. But look, at the end of the day, e even though Hamas got the jump start on this one, getting the information out eventually, it was in less than 24 hours. Uh, and it probably has, this is a bit of a counterfactual, prevented an even more inflamed response than if it had turned out that Israel was responsible for it. And of course, the sad thing here is, is no matter what happened, there's a lot of um, innocent lives that were taken. And unfortunately, we know that's probably not going to be the end of it during this war. Right. The Israelis and the U.S. and their Democratic allies and bars always have to be on the right side of this one and to recognize that the adversary is not going to be. So in cases where they have accidentally done this to take responsibility, but I don't think we can expect Hamas and Islamic Jihad 
which have just conducted these barbaric activities to do the same. They will not take responsibility for this. They're not going to talk about improving their uh, targeting process. So w w just understand that's the environment we're operating in. Seth, finally, I want to ask you about options for after major combat's over. I know you've started to think about that, but what are some of the things that, that the Israelis, the United States need to be thinking about, the world community needs to be thinking about what some options are in Gaza after major combat operations are over? This is a really good question and a really difficult one because this gets us to move from the purely military objectives of a war back to what uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the Prussian military theorist, talks about, uh, which is the political dimension of warfare as well. And so part of the question is, what happens after this phase when the Israelis go into to Gaza? What, what happens next? What do the Israelis do when some portion of it, hopefully a limited portion of Gaza, is destroyed? Uh, and a number of Hamas operatives and support network are killed or captured. What happens in Gaza? Uh, and there are a couple of things. Who, who does Israel hand control back to, or does it essentially withdraw as they have done in the past and essentially seal off Gaza? So I think there's an interesting question about whether there is some alternative Palestinian entity that the Israelis probably we would need to get help, including financially, from some select number of states to aid some kind of Palestinian entity to provide some basic law and order in the Gaza Strip. The alternative to that, if there really are no good options there, is that I think Israel weakens Hamas as much as possible and then essentially seals that border as much as it can, sort of a defense in depth, so that you make it virtually impossible to do what just happened. And let's not forget the border on the Egypt side is also sealed, remains sealed. This isn't just Israel sealing. Right. But at this point, we don't see Hamas trying to conduct a major raid into Egypt. So the, what is at stake for Israel is much more significant. Their security is much more under threat. So, no, you're right. The border on the Egyptian side is sealed. But what additional steps do the Israelis do to make sure that this kind of doesn't happen again, that you can't get vehicles and fighters and individuals flying over uh, the wall that come into southern Israel? So is that mining it? Is that building a bigger fence? Uh, those are the kinds of questions I think Israel has to think collectively through and, and that really start to get us into partly a political next steps. Seth, this is such a complex situation. Thanks so much for helping us get to some answers and think about some things. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. It is great to be on the best podcast out there. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 